tonight on our companion network, C-SPAN. Now a hearing on management of the Indian Trust Fund. A House Resources Committee task force is investigating the use of funds allocated for Native Americans and administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Arizona Congressman J.D. Hayworth chaired this hour in 40-minute hearing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the Task Force on Indian Trust Fund Management is holding its fourth and final hearing. The subject of this hearing will be possible legislative solutions to the many problems which continue to plague the management of Indian Trust Fund accounts. In order to focus our witnesses, as well as the members of our task force on legislative solutions, I have requested each member to comment upon and answer 10 questions in his or her testimony. Let me hasten to add that these questions are not J.D. Hayworth's legislative solutions. Instead, these are proposals which the task force has encountered during its consideration of Indian Trust Fund account management problems, proposals which some or all members of the task force may not agree with, but proposals which should be comment commented upon for the record. Here are the 10 questions which we hope to ask of each witness. Number one, should the federal government continue to be in the business of administering IIM accounts? Number two, would you support having DOI contract out the operation functions of managing Indian trust fund accounts to either A, a private trust management company, or B, another department of the federal government, such as the Department of the Treasury, so long as the United States retains its related trust responsibility? Number three, would you support DOI charging administrative fees to trust fund account holders to defray the cost of improving its trust fund management systems? Number four, would you support legislation which would disperse all funds in existing IIM accounts to appropriate account owners, would then terminate those IIM accounts, and would provide that in the future, whenever possible, revenues will be forwarded directly to account holders by check without going first through a trust fund account? Number five, what do you think should be done about A, fractionated airship problems, and B, the thousands of inactive, uh, or inactive IIM accounts which have no known beneficiary? Inactive account funds could be transferred to the federal government or to the tribe of the last known beneficiary or to some form of federal and or tribal escrow account held for some designated use. Six, assuming that tribal accounts cannot be reconciled any further, what settlement process do you support which would fairly compensate the tribes and would terminate any liability which the federal government might have for any breach of trust responsibility which might have taken place regarding the management of tribal accounts in the past. Number seven, assuming that IIM accounts cannot be fully reconciled, what settlement process do you support which would fairly compensate account holders and would terminate any liability which the federal government might have incurred for any breach of trust responsibility which might have taken place regarding the management of IIM accounts in the past? Number eight, what changes in existing law would facilitate the administration of tribal trust fund accounts? And number nine, what is your opinion of the proposed phase one of the special trustee strategic plan issued in February of 1996? And then number 10, what changes in existing law relating to the management of Indian trust fund accounts other than those mentioned above would you suggest be considered by the Congress of the United States? As we have commented before in these task force hearings, it is disturbing to note that many believe that the letters BIA now stand not for Bureau of Indian Affairs, but for billions in arrears. It is equally disturbing that by some accounts, what we have uncovered through audits and forensic accounting is in the words of some who have testified before us just the tip of the iceberg. This is a problem that has confronted administrations of both parties. It is a problem which we are dealing with in a bipartisan fashion. For our purpose here is to be cognizant of the trust responsibilities vested in the United States government, its trust obligations in the wake of treaties with the several 
sovereign Indian nations. I would like to thank the minority for its involvement in this task force, and I would turn to my distinguished friend from Michigan, the ranking minority member, Mr. Kildee, for any comments he might have this morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for having these hearings and, uh, and a, the really nonpartisan way in which they've been conducted. I think the, uh, the sovereignty of the tribes, which I believe in very, very strongly, it, it, it's a fact, the sovereignty of the tribes and the, the trust responsibility of the U.S. government move us to discover the facts that have brought us to the present situation and to explore possible courses of action. And I think that uh, this is what this committee hopes to be able to do, suggest. Uh, we need input from you. I think the 10 questions which you have proposed are, will be very helpful to us, and I look forward to, uh, to the responses to the questions. I thank the gentleman from Michigan for his remarks. And let us begin, then, with a special trustee for American Indians from the Department of the Interior, Paul Homan. Mr. Homan, good to have you with us this morning. We'd be interested in your opening remarks and then addressing some of the questions that we've uh, put on the table. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and if I could uh, intervene and if you'd yield for just one second, if you would also introduce the individuals who accompany you this morning to testify. I will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are pleased to be here representing the Department of the Interior. Uh, with me today is Ed Cohen, uh, who is the Deputy uh, Solicitor uh, in the Department of the Interior, and Jim Simon, who is the Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, with the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, I will give the opening remarks, and all of us will be available to answer any questions the committee may have. Uh, I will make a brief statement, but I would like uh, to request that my full statement be included uh, for the record. And I wish to note that my strategic plan uh, and assessment has been previously provided uh, for the record in previous hearings. Uh, yes, sir. Your full statement will be included in the record without objection. We thank you for it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The hearings are focusing on legislative solutions to trust management practices and problems. I would first like to present a brief report on my assessment of the trust management systems and the conceptual strategic plan which my office has divided to deal uh, with some of these longstanding problems affecting the federal government's trust management system. Of course, this will involve a number of legislative initiatives uh, if the strategic plan is to be implemented uh, successfully, including uh, the answers to some of the questions that the committee has under review. Uh, my overall assessment concludes that the undeniably poor quality of the trust management systems and the condition of the historical records effectively preclude the federal government from providing an accurate and timely accounting to American Indian trust beneficiaries. This can be demonstrated quantitatively. The Reconciliation Project in January 1996 disclosed some 2.4 billion, 32,000 transactions for which source documentation could not be located. The point here is that these records should not be missing and would not be missing had the federal government followed conventional trust record-keeping practices. A particular concern is about $575 million in unreconciled disbursements. Another concern is some $4.1 billion of so-called reconciled disbursements, which did not have complete disbursement voucher packages, and notably over $2 billion in large disbursement vouchers to tribes in care of third parties, which did not have both tribal and other governmental signed authorization. The Reconciliation Project also confirmed what the GAO calls a lack of a known universe of transactions and leases. This stems from the federal government's lack of an ability accurately to trace a collection uh, to a source, lease, or contract. This, in turn, results from the lack of a consolidated accounts receivable billing system and a mat master lease system, which at present defies auditing. At the end of 1994, there was also a two-year backlog in bringing key land ownership and records up to date. It was estimated at that time to take 104 staff years to eliminate this backlog, but instead BIA reduced its realty staff by some 29 percent from 126 staff members to 90 presently during 1995 and 1996, continuing the backlog. Turning to the IIM problems, there are 54,921 IIM accounts with 44.9 million for individuals with no address or an incorrect address. 
there are 15,234 IIM accounts with 21.8 million held for individuals who were formerly minors, the vast majority of which should have been dispersed when the age of majority was reached. There are 42.2 million in overdraft interest clearing accounts resulting from interest mispostings prior to 1993. These are essentially non-earning assets which deprive current IIM account holders annually of over $2 million in income. There are further general ledger differences of some $28 million which should be cleared uh, from the general ledger. There is a continued maintenance problem of over 153,000 uh, small accounts, some of which are the subject of this hearing, with balances less than $10, which we, which we have to run at a significant operating cost to the taxpayer. And finally, there are over 130,000 missing Social Security numbers for account holders with over $175 million in their accounts. Mr. Chairman, these conditions are unacceptable by any reasonable standards and continue to do significant harm and damage to the American Indian Trust beneficiaries. They are caused by the inherent defects in the core trust management system the government uses to manage the Indian monies. These defective systems effectively prevent the government from meeting the fiduciary accounting and reporting standards required by the American Indian Trust Management Reform Act of 1994 and standards of ordinary prudence applicable to all trustees, public or private. The Special Trustees' conceptual strategic plan addresses each of these issues and identifies nine initiatives designed to rectify the problems and bring trust accounting and management systems up to commercial standards within three years. What is needed first is a complete overhaul of the four basic trust management systems. We must acquire a new trust resource asset management delivery system. We must acquire a new accounts receivable data and automated billing system that uses lease contract and land and ownership information. We must acquire a new trust depository payments and delivery system for IIM money accounts, and we have started this initiative with fiscal 1997 monies. And finally, we must upgrade our land records and title recordation and cert certif certification system. Along with these overall uh, core systems must come improvements to our general ledger system, record keeping and archiving, risk management, our technology center, and our organizational structure. I have estimated uh, in my plan that implementation of this plan will cost $100 million over three years, and I wish to note that the President budget uh, contains uh, $14 million uh, to that effect uh, for 1997. In closing, let me just say that the problems in the trust management systems are longstanding ones. If mismanagement or negligence occurred, it stemmed principally, in my view, from allowing the trust management systems, record-keeping systems, and risk management systems to deteriorate over a 20 to 30 year period and become obsolete and ineffective. For many of those years, including many years since 1990, the trust programs were seriously understaffed and underfunded. The result was that the government increasingly was unable to keep pace with the rapid changes and improvements in technology, trust systems, and prudential best practices taking place in the private sector industry. This gap continues today and will continue to increase until the reforms outlined in the strategic plan are funded and implemented. That is why they should be funded and implemented, in my view, immediately, regardless of if and when the comprehensive strategic plan called for in the Reform Act of 1994 is completed and approved. Each day, the trust management systems remain status quo. The federal government's exposure to claims of mismanagement and liability will continue to grow, and as another day, the federal government cannot meet its trust responsibilities to the American Indians. The comprehensive strategic plan is scheduled for completion by March 31, 1997. It will address uh, in depth many of the issues and concerns raised by this committee at its hearings today and in previous hearings. Included in my fourth statement are our initial answers to the committee's questions. Further research and analysis will be required over the coming months to arrive at sound legislative solutions to these longstanding trust management problems, and we look forward to working with the committee in that regard. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer uh, the questions uh, that you outlined for us uh, in more detail or uh, any other questions you may have. Mr. Holman, we thank you for your efforts as the special, special trustee. 
at the Interior Department. We also thank you again for your testimony this morning. Um, we put before you 10 questions, and uh, we appreciate your response and very thoughtful inclusion of the question and answers on your prepared testimony. Uh, let me, in a general sense, before I get to some of the specific uh, notions outlined in those 10 questions and your 10 responses, ask you, sir, in a perfect world, and admittedly, this has been one uh, of gross imperfection with reference to uh, what has happened to these special accounts. If you were to design the perfect system, uh, what would you be most uh, interested in doing? If you had to rank the different legislative alternatives or what your solution would be, what would you rank first? Well, I would rank first the accurate accounting uh, to the American Indi Indian beneficiaries uh, of their account balances and the monies the government handles uh, from start to finish, uh, starting with the leasing of the land, a collection of the proceeds off those leases, investments, uh, and finally uh, disbursements. And to do that, uh, I believe that eight of my nine strategic plan initiatives uh, will address that. It will bring essentially uh, the banking part of the Bureau of Indian Affairs up to commercial standards within three years. And that's no different than, uh, in my view, uh, trying to uh, go to the bank across the street. Every single commercial bank and trust company in the United States has a system uh, which is capable of producing 100 percent accounting. And that's essentially the place to start. Now, in a perfect world, as trustee, uh, for the American Indians. Uh, my plan also uh, contemplates a system with a common set of policies and procedures, a common set of accounting standards, a common system which is run by the government, and a common set of laws uh, by which uh, the trustee can effectively uh, downstream or delegate uh, the operating authority to uh, Indians themselves under self-government principles to third parties, uh, or uh, in certain instances, uh, because of affordability problems and others, uh, to be continued with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But the trustee, as long as the U.S. government remains in the trustee capacity, in my view, uh, it must have a way in to determine whether uh, the operators of the Indian trust lands are doing their job. Sir, I can recall your previous testimony here before this task force when you talked about your own resume and your rather extensive experience. Indeed, in your response to me just now, you mentioned uh, the situation which exists with commercial banking with an ability to account for 100 percent of uh, the money deposit holders possess and, and the status of those accounts. It seems, Mr. Holman, it, it begs the question, if commercial banks can do this, taking into account even the legitimate trust obligations that this federal government has, and perhaps because of those trust obligations, would it not be more cost effective to turn to an outside entity to provide this service? And could an outside entity, a financial house, or some financial institution do this job more effectively and more cheaply than your projection of, what, $100 million over three years to completely overhaul the accounting system? Well, certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman, outsourcing uh, some of these activities is, uh, is not only possible but uh, may be desirable. Uh, and at a certain point in the future, uh, providing uh, the government is satisfied that it can do the correct risk management, i.e., auditing of whoever that third party is that's performing the trust function, uh, provided that's satisfied, then I think that's quite possible. Uh, and it can be done, I think, uh, I don't think it can be done for less than $100 million. And I think the $100 million has to be sent to first fix the system. Uh, I think there has been, I'm told that there have been attempts in the past to turn over. 
a good part of these operations to uh, private sector large banks that have this cash management and trust capacity. Uh, but the uh, question has always been uh, affordability. It's always been more than uh, the government uh, has been willing to pay first. And secondly, uh, there's not been a full accounting, as we all know, of these uh, trust balances. And uh, a private institution taking over the administration of these accounts would probably uh, ask for indemnification uh, from the federal government uh, for past practices or for uh, errors and omissions in uh, the lack of a full accounting. So that has been an impediment. I believe before we could even consider outsourcing it, we have to fix the system first. Uh, the $100 million will get there. After that, uh, it's an operating uh, expense of uh, less than $20 million a year, which might be affordable. Sir, I've taken a look at uh, your written responses, and um, we put before all our witnesses today a variety of different alternatives that uh, some have mentioned to us. I'm concerned about the response uh, to, to question three. Would you support DOI charging administrative fees to trust fund account holders to defray the cost of improving its trust fund management systems? Uh, you respond that administrative fees might be charged to defray the cost, uh, that the department is researching the issue of whether fees should be charged account holders with large balances or activity. Uh, do you view this as a viable uh, policy alternative? Is it something that would be, in fact, under active consideration to charge the account holders? Yes, I think it is under active consideration. Uh, my personal view on this, and I, I don't think it uh, differs with the department's uh, views, is, is first, uh, the, the question uh, addresses whether administrative fees should be charged to defray the cost of improving the trust systems. Uh, I don't believe personally that that should be the case. Uh, these systems have been uh, in disrepair for a number of years, and to ask current account holders to pay for the uh, past errors and omissions in terms of staffing and funding for these systems, uh, I don't believe is a, is a way to uh, approach it. Uh, but going forward, I think that the larger accounts, uh, we might charge uh, an administrative fee, much like a bank uh, would charge. Uh, we're in a monopolistic uh, uh, circumstance here, so I don't believe we should charge anything more uh, than a comparable uh, commercial trust company would charge for these same services for large accounts. Secondly, a good many of these uh, accounts are very small, and we deal with uh, tribes that are very poor. And I think questions of affordability uh, come into question, and I think there ought to be an exemption uh, for tribes with small accounts or for tribes which simply can't afford uh, to pay the type of uh, administrative and trust fees that uh, are uh, common in, uh, in, a, in, in the American private sector trust business. So with those caveats, uh, I think we should uh, uh, charge. Third, there is a large category here that runs through uh, some of these questions uh, of over 150,000 accounts with balances less than $10. Now, these are caused by uh, our having to deal with fractionated uh, shares, where uh, sometimes we keep track of less than a penny uh, due on certain of these properties to certain of the property owners. Uh, that is an enormous operating cost. Uh, the realty people uh, tell me in our suggested uh, fractionated interest uh, uh, legislation that it costs somewhat like $33 million, or about half their annual budget, just to keep track of these small fractionated uh, interests. We have the same problem in keeping track of them at OTFM. Uh, these are largely dormant and inactive accounts. Uh, the government has not found a way uh, to get rid of them. And uh, normally, uh, a bank would cheat these accounts to the state uh, or uh, service charge them, uh, you know, appropriately. And I believe uh, that a service charge in our uh, case uh, might be uh, doable. Uh, there, is, there are questions of constitutional taking, which came up uh, in the Ninth Circuit in connection with the land, uh, the Indian Land Consolidation Act in the mid-'80s, and which is now pending before the uh, Supreme Court. So we have to be very careful 
in terms of uh, how we go about administering these uh, trust fees. But I think in that case, we should. It's costing the American taxpayer probably five or six times in operating costs what it costs to maintain those small accounts. And I don't believe a $10 account uh, is worth uh, much of anything uh, to uh, any, any American Indian. I think they'd like to get rid of the problem as well. Mr. Holman, you'll be pleased to know that uh, in taking <coughs> these hearings outside the Beltway to the 6th District of Arizona, uh, we met with many tribal leaders, and many of them have lauded your efforts. Uh, even as they have lauded your efforts, they have lamented uh, what they believe to be some deficiencies in, in, uh, in your purview of, of being able to really uh, complete your strategic plan. And I'm just curious, has the department ever told you why it's been unable to reprogram funds to your office so that you could complete your strategic plan? Well, I, uh, during my confirmation hearings uh, before the Senate last year in September, I was asked what it would uh, cost uh, essentially to complete my strategic plan within the time frame one year that the law gave me. And I uh, indicated at that time that it was $3.5 million and that I would ask uh, the Department uh, for that money for fiscal 1996. Now, unfortunately, uh, the fiscal 1996 uh, budget uh, got tied up, uh, as you all know, with continuing resolutions uh, all last year. Uh, it never changed for whatever reason uh, from the uh, $447,000 that was actually uh, given to me uh, for 1996. With that uh, amount of money, I could not complete uh, my strategic plan and, and I could not uh, hire the staff uh, that would uh, have made it uh, possible. Uh, there was, uh, I requested uh, the department to uh, reprogram uh, monies, but for whatever reason, uh, the priority uh, was not uh, apparently high enough uh, for them to make that change last year. Mr. Chairman, if I may just add, um, this question had come up in one of the prior hearings, uh, and I checked with our budget people, and what I am told is that the Se Office of Secretary did not have the authority to reprogram, that because of the way the accounts are set up, it would have required coming back to Congress. Uh, uh, Mr. Homan's office is a, is a separate budgetary unit. We can provide additional information to the task force on that point if you would like. I'm not a budget expert, but that's my understanding. With regard to funding of the, of the rest of the plan, uh, the administration, as Mr. Homan indicated, asked for uh, $36 million in 1997, of which I believe um, 14 or 17 million goes, 14 million goes to the implementation of the plan. Uh, we're hopeful that Congress will respond positively to that, and each progressive uh, budget submitted by the administration will include uh, significant sums, I suspect, for the implementation of the plan as the strategic plan is completed and approved by Congress. Well, I thank you for adding those remarks because it does seem to, to raise a new specter here, and, and we have touched on it previously. In a department which uh, has an annual appropriation of uh, some $12 billion, uh, again, without the, the accounting expertise, it would simply seem that common sense would dictate that the Secretary has a broad purview over discretionary spending. And as I've said before, uh, I think whomever sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in the years to come working with the Congress has to reconsider the way in which we have treated the first Americans. For we have Native Americans categorized in the Department of the Interior which seems to betray to me some sort of uh, antiquated notion. And I think somehow we get lost in the translation that we're taking the lives of human beings and their destinies and we're putting them in the back seat as opposed to rocks and trees and critters. Now, I'd be the first to say we need to preserve our precious environment, but we must also honor our commitments to the first Americans, and that's what gives me pause. So I'd, I would like to see further quantification uh, from the budgeteers and the folks at Interior and find out 
given the nature of this problem and now the urgency that the forensic accounting reveals why the secretary or whomever has not offered uh, more or served more as a catalyst with discretionary funds to to help complete that mission. If I could add a little more detail, and I, and I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point, I wish our budget was $12 billion. It isn't. Uh, I think it's, I, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I know it isn't in, in that range, maybe in the seven to $9 billion range. Secondly, I, I think that as, as has become clear through these hearings, this is going to take a partnership between the administration and the Congress to solve this problem. It's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, the President's request was $36.3 million. Uh, the, House appropriate, the House appropriated $19.1 million for Mr. Homan. The Senate, $36.3 million, and we're hoping that whatever comes out will be, obviously, from our vantage point, closer to the Senate number. But you're quite right. I think this is going to require an effort of both the executive and the legislative branch to, to get this problem solved. I think we can both agree that the uh, the budget for the Interior Department is certainly bigger than a billion dollar bread box. There's a significant is. sum of money there. And uh, I again think we do need to look though and see with whatever powers of discretion the Secretary has, given the urgent nature of this problem, given the fact now that there are pending court cases and civil action has been taken, it would seem to suggest to me some urgency to say, well, here are billions of dollars appropriated, and yes, a number of different priorities. What would prevent this from moving higher on the priority list? But you're quite right. We would hope to continue a productive dialogue uh, with the administration and with the executive branch, whomever may head it in the years to come. Let me turn to my distinguished colleague, the ranking minority member of the task force, Mr. Kildee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> When I uh, first came to Congress, uh, Gerald Ford was president. At that time, we had achieved the point where the, we had reached our first billion-dollar Congress. I remember Gerald Ford mentioned that in the, uh, the State of the Union message. And uh, perhaps one good way to find the $36 million is to look at our own budget and find some dollars there. Um, I, I, this is, t to my mind, a, a question of real justice, and my primary goal is to achieve justice uh, for the Indian nations and tribes and people in this country, and that's been my primary goal as I've been in the Congress in this area. Um, it's, it's incredible that this has happened. I happen to really appreciate uh, the Chairman's uh, tenacity, because this is, this is a, a complicated area to explore. Every time you look at it, you find more complications, but I appreciate your tenacity on this. Let me ask this question. I'm not even sure I can ask it in the right way. You're, you're the expert in this, but while trying to achieve justice for the Native Americans, uh, can we or should we at some point achieve or declare closure on a number of, of the unreconciled accounts uh, while trying to fix the system for the future. I'm not, I'm not sure that question is phrased that well or not, but if you can take that and try to respond to a... Well, I think at, at some point uh, we must come to a closure uh, with the harm and damage uh, claims that have arisen out of the uh, deficiencies in the trust management uh, systems. Uh, and one way to do that is to fix the systems uh, so that at least uh, you can stop the bleeding, uh, so to speak, because our current systems, uh, for the most part, are no different uh, than they were in 1992 when the reconciliation project uh, concluded. So as my staff uh, is wont to say, uh, we may be in the fourth year of a new uh, reconciliation uh, project, and I am here to say that based on my observations, if we did another reconciliation project today of the last four years, we would find uh, similar exceptions, similar deficiencies, similar amounts of missing <coughs> records uh, than uh, we did uh, with the 20-year uh, reconciliation project, which we concluded uh, last year, based upon uh, the end of 1992. So uh, 
One way to bring closure to the past is to uh, assure that going forward we can provide the accurate accounting which is required by the Reform Act. Uh, then uh, you can separate it as a bank would into the uh, institution going forward uh, and the institution uh, uh, in the past and work down these exceptions. The 154,000 uh, accounts that have no known address, uh, for example, we have made significant prog progress in working some of those accounts down. However, uh, the minute we uh, stop, we get more over the transom, so to speak, coming in the door uh, because the current systems uh, have not been modernized. And this is uh, basically uh, in, its, uh, in its simplest form a record-keeping problem. Uh, and uh, if we fix the record-keeping problem, then we'll be able to deal with both the past and the future in a sensible way. To achieve uh, closure, which uh, contained within a justice, uh, would that require legislation on uh, behalf of a part of the Congress? Yes, I'd like to have uh, our uh, representative from the Department of Justice uh, answer that, and also uh, if if Ed would like to to chime in on that. <coughs> Congressman, um, thank you. I I would refer. Uh, you respectfully to uh, some of the issues you raised. The, the last time we were here, I be believe that was at the beginning of the summer, and uh, we reported that the Interior Department was making information available to all the tribal account holders from the reconciliation and would be asking the tribes to attest as to whether or not they had an objection and, if so, uh, what their objection was, and that we would report back to Congress uh, by November 15th as to what the objections and exceptions made by the tribes were and that we would then uh, try to analyze those exceptions and uh, uh, try to work with Congress on a solution. I think we are all interested, as you say, uh, Congressman, uh, in achieving justice. I think we're all interested in doing it in a way uh, which is expeditious, which doesn't uh, squander money uh, or time in uh, needless uh, litigation or dispute. And uh, I think that the, what we have in mind is to uh, gather the information from the tribes as to what they think uh, the exceptions are, and then work with them and with Congress and try to craft a solution. That may involve legislation. It's too early to say. So it may require some action outside the executive branch of government to bring some type of just closure to this, or some type of closure that contains justice, then? It, it very well may, sir. I think that uh, we hope to know a little bit more in November, and we'll uh, re report to you, and we will be pleased to work with you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just wondering uh, what would have happened, what would happen if uh, in the State Department we were running through the foreign aid accounts and found such a, such a situation? There'd really be probably some heads rolling over there. And we're not dealing with foreign aid here, we're dealing with uh, the first Americans. It just uh, seems incredible that this has grown up. But I think we, that's as already happened, I think we have to say now, what can we do now? And I, I'm certainly happy that, uh, Mr. Holman, that you're doing what you are doing. I think you have to be funded. I think that uh, this is a, a very serious problem. You have to have the adequate funds so you can carry out uh, your, your mandate. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman from Michigan for his point of view. Uh, gentlemen, before we dismiss any other comments from any of you, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could, an issue that you haven't raised, but I see that uh, Mr. Oldperson raises it in his testimony, and, I, and because he's coming after us, I'd like to address his comments. He indicates in his statement that he was, that, that a meeting in Phoenix uh, was abruptly canceled at which Mr. Homan was going to consult with the tribes uh, on uh, settlement issues. And without boring you with all the details, let me outline briefly what happened, because I think Mr. Oldperson is justifiably upset, uh, and I think he and the Native community is owed both an explanation uh, and an apology. Um, prior to the, the meeting was scheduled for, um, I, I guess, a week ago Monday, and the purpose of it, as I indicated, was to discuss settlement options. Now, as you know, there are two categories of uh, claims that we're looking at. One category are the, the so-called IIM accounts, uh, and the second are the tribal accounts. 
uh, we had some concern about the extent to which uh, settlement would be discussed with the task force, Mr. Homan's task force, of which Mr. Uh, uh, old person uh, uh, refers uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, with regard to the IIM accounts, there's litigation pending. A class action suit was filed in midsummer, and uh, at this point, counsel for the plaintiffs and counsel for the United States in the form of the Justice Department uh, have been meeting, and I think somewhat productively, to try to scope out an approach to resolving the issues. Uh, Mr. Kildee, when you asked your question about how are we going to resolve this, it, it is quite possible that the IIM uh, uh, accounts will be resolved, or at least the framework for resolving them could evolve from the litigation, depending upon how successful we are at working out an approach. Those discussions are in a very sensitive state, and uh, we were quite concerned about having uh, discussions by anyone other than counsel for the parties going on. Uh, with regard to the uh, tribal accounts, um, uh, the, 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 uh, Mr. Homan has been conducting discussions with the, um, with the advisory committee, and we had no problems with that. Uh, but I did send him a memo uh, immediately prior to his meeting that said, made two points. One was that with regard to the IIM accounts, he shouldn't discuss settlement of the, of the litigation. The second point that I made with regard to the tribal accounts was that to the extent that he has confidential and, uh, and privileged information by virtue of his being a employee of the Department of the Interior, he should steer clear from revealing or discussing that in the context of his meeting. For whatever reason, whether the memo wasn't written clearly or whatever, uh, what he read was not what I thought we had written and he interpreted the memo as saying that he could not discuss settlement issues. That was not in any way, shape, or form what was intended to be communicated, at least with respect to the tribal accounts. Unfortunately, when he read the memo, uh, he concluded, uh, as I indicated, that he could not discuss settlement issues, and, the, and that portion of his meeting was terminated. Uh, I want to apologize to the members, uh, the tribal leaders who traveled to Phoenix to participate in that meeting. Uh, that should not have happened, and I think it is a departmental-wide uh, uh, issue that, uh, uh, that, that should have been resolved prior to the meeting. Uh, and I just wanted to bring that up and, again, apologize to Mr. Old Person and apologize to the tribal leaders. Mr. Cohen, I appreciate you raising this, but it does not offer absolution indeed it raises an entire an entirely new specter of of a very disconcerting problem here we've just finished hearing testimony about how acute and how badly needed resources are to solve this problem and yet now we're reminded of a non meeting taking place in my home state, presumably with folks journeying nationwide or across the continent to attend the meeting, and then having it abruptly terminated for a misunderstanding or whatever, this is, it's a waste of money. It's, it's the very thing we lament in the entire process. And you bring to mind something else when you talk about the advisory group that I really, before I bid you adieu this morning, I, I want to get into. And, and let me discuss this with Mr. Holman. Uh, recalling the testimony of Ivan Makel, the chairman of the Salt River Pima Indian community in my district, I believe he's a part of that special advisory council, but as I understand it now, that group will not meet with you again until well into 1997, at least according to the testimony he presented to us in Arizona. Why the delay in that, Mr. Homan? Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Makel uh, probably meant fiscal 1997. Uh, there was no money uh, allocated uh, last year uh, to fund advisory board. 
uh, meetings. So uh, we have uh, met essentially uh, over the phone. We had one organizational meeting uh, in December of last year, and this was in connection uh, with uh, settlement options and other uh, criteria having uh, to do with the reconciliation project. So we are scheduled to meet again uh, in December of this year uh, with a follow-up meeting uh, in February uh, to discuss uh, the final stages of my uh, strategic plan. Thank you for clearing that matter up for me. One, one thing I would request also in writing, if it can be provided, uh, the cost, the expenditure of transport of government officials to Phoenix, Arizona for a meeting that could not take place, I'd like to know what that costs the taxpayers of this nation. And I'd like to see, again, more detail. You said you didn't want to bore me with details, and I will respect that this morning. But I'd like, in writing, please, an explanation of exactly why this was terminated. I'm sure the American people appreciate the apology, but I don't believe they easily excuse what can only be described as a waste of funds. Mr. Chairman, uh, we will uh, be glad to provide that for the record. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words about that meeting myself. Uh, when I received the advice from the Department of Justice, I uh, conferred with my staff uh, and uh, we felt, all of us felt, that it precluded me, restrained me, uh, if you will, from uh, discussing uh, the settlement options uh, with not only the tribal uh, members present, of which there were uh, representatives from 15 tribes, uh, but also with the advisory board itself, because by definition, uh, the advisory board members, five of them, had to ha be uh, members uh, from tribes with tribal accounts. So with that, I felt I had no choice. Uh, I didn't want to put my staff in jeopardy uh, but to call off the meeting. Uh, I have since received a, another memo uh, indicating, as Ed indicated, that, that I may have misunderstood that memorandum, uh, but that memo was given to me yesterday. Uh, my staff and I's reading is still uh, that I am restrained from uh, doing uh, any type of uh, consultation on legislative settlement options uh, with my advisory board. Uh, they have offered, uh, along with the Department of Justice, to work with me in trying to clarify uh, certain aspects of that latest advice, and uh, I will be doing that over the next week or two. Well, we certainly appreciate that, and I'm sure you shared the regret of having to travel and, for whatever reason, having the meeting abruptly uh, canceled. Um, and one is tempted to try and comfort you, saying, well, it must happen all the time, but that's exactly the problem we tend to have in this government that has grown so vast and uh, so encyclopedic in its endeavors that the, uh, whether it's the right hand or the left hand or whatever analogy you want to use, somehow we don't seem to be able to coordinate and we end up spending taxpayers' dollars needlessly or in, in vain, as I think uh, this indicated in, in, in this episode. Mr. Chairman, one, one final comment. Uh, the, the meeting uh, was a general meeting on uh, not only the reconciliation project, uh, but specific uh, issues uh, for each of the tribal uh, members uh, present. Uh, we did uh, discuss uh, those items uh, in a general forum. Uh, so the, uh, the settlement option uh, proposal and settlement option discussion was only one part of the meeting. So it wasn't a a complete uh, waste of the government uh, money. But that was the principal purpose of the conference, was to discuss uh, the settlement proposal and settlement options. Well, gentlemen, I thank you very much. If you have nothing further to add, we will thank you for your time uh, this morning, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now the task force will welcome the chairman of the Intertribal Monitoring Association for Indian Trust Funds, Eric Davenport, uh, to the witness table. And Mr. Davenport, we appreciate your attendance this morning, even as we bid farewell to our first panel.
Yes, sir, welcome. Would you state your name and uh, your role? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm David Harrison. I'm uh, part of the professional staff of the Intertribal Monitoring Association on Indian Trust Funds. Our chairman, Mr. Eric Davenport, who is the business manager for the Central Council of Clinkett and Haida Tribes in Southeast Alaska, is stormbound in Juneau. And the planes are not flying, and he deeply regrets that he can't be here. But he asked us to express his very great appreciation for the leadership that this committee and this task force has shown in this very important subject. And has asked me to elaborate on his prepared statement that was delivered to the committee uh, in advance of today's hearing. And while we did, Mr. Chairman, address each of the 10 questions that the committee put forward in, the, in our prepared statement, I'd like to focus a little bit on just a couple of those in our uh, discussion this morning. And then, of course, we'll be happy to respond to any questions that you or members of the task force may have. With respect to one of the questions about settlement, and it goes, I think, to a question that Mr. Mr. Kildee asked of Mr. Homan, and what might be done in that arena and to facilitate a settlement. We would like to associate ourselves entirely with the remarks of Mr. Homan that we think there are very definitely things that can be done and should be done to, uh, to use his words, and I'm not sure he hasn't borrowed them from us in previous meetings, but to stop the bleeding, to begin to put into place some of the systems and some of the controls that are definitely and desperately needed in order to protect the government from uh, future liabilities that he has described and in order to protect the Indians from future losses of the kind and of the magnitude that they have suffered in the past. Some of these we think are already on his list and we simply urge this task force and the Congress to continue to support him in an effort to put some of those into place. Some kind of an accounts receivable system so that the entire system won't simply be triggered by what comes over the transom every morning when people come to work in 85 or 90 different places around the country. But some kind of a system so that the more than 50 million acres of land and timber and grazing land and farmland and irrigated pasture and cropland and oil and gas and coal and phosphate and copper mines that are operating out there are put on some kind of a basis so that there's a regular and routine procedure for seeing that those activities on Indian lands are paying what they should pay and paying it in a timely fashion. Some of the other things that you suggested or asked in your questions, we have long urged be undertaken, and we understand they also are on the list. That is, in terms of outsourcing some of the activities that are going on now, we have urged for years that there be some form of centralized custodial services that probably should be done by a private contractor, by a commercial institution, for the more than $2 billion of securities that are held by that office on a daily basis. We talk about the size of this portfolio as being a $2.5 billion portfolio but with investments being made on a daily basis, with previous investments maturing on a daily basis, the actual volume of transactions conducted by that office is in the scores of billions of dollars a year of our money. And right now, those securities that represent that couple billion dollars are scattered in a hundred different institutions from coast to coast and border to border. And it is not unknown for some of those to go missing for periods of time. Even during the current reconcil or the recently completed reconciliation project, a $12 million TVA bond that had been called some two years earlier was uh, discovered not to be being carried correctly on the books. So that kind of activity, which increasingly, as Mr. Homan described, even private sector institutions, even commercial banks themselves, are increasingly turning to each other and to specialized institutions for those kinds of uh, needed services and are, are being outsourced. 
We also would urge this committee to see to it that there is an, some kind of an annual audit of these activities. Uh, we have recently concluded an effort of what we call a balance sheet audit for fiscal years 95 and 96. But we've gone from the 91 to 95, the very period in which we were spending four years and $20 million to reconstruct the books, we didn't bother to audit them at all. And notwithstanding what appears to us to be the requirements of both the Chief Financial Officers Act and the Trust Fund Reform Act, we think we definitely need to get this program on a, on a scheduled basis of routine annual independent audits. And we need to be, enable the Office of the Trustee to develop an inventory of the leases and agreements that generate these funds and enable him to conduct the kinds of daily reconciliations that Mr. Holman says we would demand of any, even the smallest commercial bank in the country. We would demand that kind of daily reconciliation and we haven't provided the capability for, for our own government to, to do it for us. And then finally, oh, the other thing I'd like to really to focus on a bit is in response to your invitation to discuss some changes in the law that we think might be needed. We are very grateful, as we've indicated to you in the past, for the position of the trustee and for the presence in that position of Mr. Holman. But we know he's not always going to be in that position. And as grateful as we are for him there now, we think that the position itself perhaps merits a little bit of, of attention now. We would like to see some measure of increased independence for that position for the various, so we could avoid the very thing you were just discussing that happened in Phoenix last week. If this man's good enough for the President and he's good enough for the Senate of the United States, to be put in charge of this problem, he ought to be allowed to at least talk to the people whose money it is. And uh, so we think some measure, greater measure of independence in the conduct of that office is probably in order. However, we remember the, the teachings of our youth that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so we're not saying that we think Mr. Holman or anybody in that position should be made a, a unilateral czar. But then we ask, well, what kind of oversight should there be available? Well, we think maybe he comes from the place where that oversight should reside. Perhaps the comptroller of the currency, the same officer, the same agency that provides oversight and direction to all of these other commercial institutions that we're holding up as an example, uh, could also be asked to provide that kind of annual review, examination, oversight of these activities. We don't think that the other routine oversight bodies in either Interior or Justice or even the GAO would be as suitable for that purpose as the OCC. Uh, we invite the task force to uh, make their own inquiries of those other agencies in that regard, but I believe you will be told, <coughs> told that as well. So we need some, we think some measure of oversight for that office, and we think that office within that general oversight should be given the flexibility and independence to do the job that he was brought in to do. And f along those lines of legislation that we might suggest to the task force, any commercial bank today is required by law to do something that these guys would go to jail for if they did do, and that is to correct their own mistakes. As I mentioned with the TVA bond, as we know, again, during the course of this $20 million reconciliation effort, we accept the guilty pleas from a couple of government employees for pilfering some of these funds. We don't know. A commercial bank, when faced with its own mistakes, recognize them, acknowledge them, fess up to them, and use their own 
equity or reserve accounts to make them whole. We really must figure out a way to give this officer the authority to correct the mistakes that he knows about. And uh, whether that is to create a reserve account for him for that purpose or to authorize him the same way that people in litigation now can enter into stipulated agreements for access to the judgment fund, that could work. There are a number of ways that that might work. But it doesn't do any good to give him all the tools in the world to do his job right and to find his own mistakes, and there will be mistakes. Wells Fargo makes mistakes. But if he can't fix them when he finds them, we really haven't profited much by the exercise. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have, and thank you once again for your time and leadership in this important matter. Mr. Harrison, we thank you for coming this morning to testify in the stead of Mr. Davenport, and uh, we understand that the snow is falling in a variety of places, not only in our 49th state, but within the contiguous borders of the United States, so we appreciate you coming in to, to shed more light on Mr. Davenport's testimony, which will, of course, be included in the record as it was prepared. In fact, before we return to the very intriguing notions uh, that, uh, that you offer here, let me first note that uh, our friend from Michigan, was uh, his presence was required at another hearing this morning, so we welcome our good friend and colleague from Montana, Mr. Williams, uh, to the task force hearing this morning. Uh, I understand here, and I think we need to get this in the record, that the perception of the Intertribal Monitoring Association is that the $2 billion figure that has been bandied about as a result of the audits and the forensic accounting that has gone on is just the tip of the iceberg. As I mentioned earlier and as we heard in testimony from people in our opening hearing, uh, the testimony of Mr. Davenport, which I'd like you to expound upon if you could please, uh, Mr. Harrison, is this assertion. Over $200 billion in investment transactions were excluded and are left unreconciled. Now, to people who may just be hearing of these problems, this exponential increase is nothing short of astounding. Over $200 billion left unreconciled. What is the rationale that you offer for that assertion? Excuse me. The efforts by the contractors, and like everything else you've heard here this morning, constrained by both time and money and where they were going to put the effort that was available to them, chose early on to focus on the money coming in and going out of the system, what basically we call collections and disbursements. And there was about nearly $18 billion of those kinds of transactions. What you here referred to as the non-investment transactions. Well, that $18 billion that came in and out of the system over that 20-year period was very largely scrubbed. And those are the numbers that you've heard Mr. Christie describe to you in terms of the percentages of both high percentages of both numbers and dollars that were scrubbed. What did not get that kind of a scrub, although it did get some, in our view, little more than perfunctory examination, but were the more than $200 billion of transactions that took place with that money while it was in the system. Those are what we call the investment transactions. And that's what I alluded to earlier when I said, while we have a $2.5 billion portfolio, we conduct scores of billions of dollars of transactions every year. Now that we are largely out of the commercial certificates of deposit and more into strictly treasury paper, we don't have the level of investment transaction that we used to have. But I would guess we're still at a 50 to $60 billion a year level of investment transactions. Those are the transactions that did not get the kind of scrub that the collections and disbursements got. And we say that we think that is where a number of errors were likely to have been found that weren't found because they simply weren't looked for. As I mentioned, even while this exercise was going on, we lost track of a $12.5 million bond for a couple of years. 
And uh, in an enterprise this size, some, as I said, there are going to be mistakes. And to their credit, they found this one. We didn't find it for them. They found it themselves through the own improvements they had made in their procedures. But we know that those procedures were not in place for the last 20 years. And we very strongly believe that, and we, and we know a number of tribes that say to us, we think this money lay uninvested for six months when it should have been invested. We think this money was not reinvested when it matured the way it should have been. And so that's why we say that that other $200 billion of transactions did not get the scrub that we wish it had. And we have no doubt there would have been a good deal many more errors and omissions found and reported had that happened. So that's what we mean when we say the two billion that we so cheerfully tell you about, in our view, really does represent only the tip of the iceberg. Mr. Harrison, you also mentioned perhaps in, in the tale of the uh, of the bond or in some other, some other episode uh, a documented case, an example of someone within the federal government, someone vested to uh, take care of these uh, trust responsibilities, uh, I believe your term was pilfering some of the proceeds. Is this a unique example, or do you have documentation of other actions taken by those who have been entrusted with the, the care of these monies uh, to be less than uh, straightforward? We have at least one other documented example that we know of where an individual in a position of A, access, and B, trust within the agency handling these monies have helped themselves. In one case, it was a man. In one case, it was a woman. So we're, we're gender neutral here. Uh, and I might say that we have a, we've discussed another documented case in which it was not a government agent at all, but... Uh, a uh, bona fide crook that swindled over $8 million out of the agency's trust funds uh, under the guise he set up a bogus institution and bet on the money and got it. The government caught him and recovered most of the money. Uh, the president's budget for this very fiscal year included a $14 million request to make whole that loss, and the Congress had not seen fit this year to, to make that whole, but that's a known documented loss that the President's own budget officers have, uh, have quantified and, and submitted to the Congress to be made whole. Which goes to our, one of our other points, Mr. Chairman, if I just could uh, press my own point a little, about the authority that's needed for these people to correct their known mistakes. That's, uh, it's not a crime to make, a, I guess it's, it shouldn't be a crime to make a mistake. It should be a crime to cover it up, and it should be a crime not to make it right. And those are the two areas where we find real fault and where we take great issue and where we suggest that nothing less than the integrity of the nation is at stake when it comes to covering them up and not making them right. And you offer an intriguing policy initiative or action that we can perhaps take legislatively when you talk about the role of the special trustee and increased independence for that trustee. Uh, I'd like to revisit that and, and get your thoughts about that a little bit more and then I'll defer to my colleague from, from Montana. Uh, are you saying the special trustee, just to understand this, should come really under the auspices of the office of the controller of the currency, there should be that transfer there, uh, or would the trustee take on a status not unlike what we've seen in the whole area of Indian gaming, or uh, if you, Mr. Harrison, in the world according to David Harrison, uh, if you were offering the suggestion of how best increase the independence of the special trustee, but at the same time have that genuine accountability, what do you perceive to be the best course of action? I think that today, and by the way, let me say when I say that I think that today, just like with Mr. Holman's strategic plan, we're all for the first seven or eight steps he's laid out today, 
But we expect to get smarter as this process goes on. And so we're not saying that we think we've got the final answer all figured out in, in advance. But if I were to design it today, I would go more along the second alternative that you suggested. I, don't, I did not have in mind, and I don't mean to suggest that he should be transferred to or in any way become a part of the OCC, but rather that that is the kind of oversight body and agency that already exists. If it's good enough for 290 million other Americans and their money, uh, maybe it would work for the million or two of us to have money in this system too. But I have um, thought maybe more along the lines that you suggested with the, the gaming commission that is a part of the Interior Department. Uh, their budget is a part of that, the rest of that $12 billion that Mr. Cohen wasn't too sure where you got the number. Well, part of it goes to that guy, part of it goes to other, what, they, what your budget people call Interior and its related agencies. But, but the Gaming Commission operates independently. It has its own professional staff. It has its own, as I believe, it even has its own legal counsel. And it operates under the terms and the direction and guidance provided by, by the Congress. And, and oversees an operation that's bigger than uh, this trust fund business by a considerable order of magnitude. That's probably a six or eight billion dollar business that's overseen by, by that agency. And it seems to be working. And it doesn't put the people in that are charged with the oversight of that enormous and, and expanding industry uh, subject to the same kinds of personnel rules and requirements. We had a situation in trust funds just recently where people that we'd spent $20,000 in training were busted out of the system by a reduction in force and replaced by people that, according to the federal personnel rules, an accountant is an accountant is an accountant, and any one of them could bump in and knock out the guys that we had just spent $20,000 training in accounting for and recording amortizations and accretions and interest in fiduciary accounting. And we get people coming in who have been used to counting fence posts for the range project, but if they could count a fence post, they, people think they can count securities. And so that's the kind of problem that we think Mr. Holman needs to be freed up from to the best we can make it happen so that he can get on with his rat killing. And there's plenty for him to do without having to fight these just other bureaucratic problems. Well, I appreciate your observations and especially the notion that you offered in response uh, talking about uh, the perhaps uh, the role of the OCC in this saying if it's good enough for the majority of Americans, why would there be a separation there? Uh, I think we always want to be mindful of the special uh, trust and treaty obligations uh, that exist uh, between this government and the several sovereign Indian nations, but I think that is a very valid point, uh, and I thank you for those observations. With that, let me turn to my good friend uh, uh, from Montana, Mr. Williams, for his comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this. Uh, this issue, as you know, Mr. Harrison, has been very troubling for uh, the Congress, uh, both members of the House and Senate, for a, a number of years. And uh, rec fully recognizing the um, enormous complexities that are involved in trying to find solutions to the problem, uh, Nonetheless, a great many of us have joined America's tribal governments in impatience about what we perceive to be the on-again, off-again, stuttering progress or non-progress that is being made. I do want to note that uh, after very close scrutiny of this issue for quite a long time, many of us have faith in the work of the special trustee 
in Mr. Holman personally and are hopeful that uh, he will not only be uh, continuing to pursue this but uh, allowed to do so uh, in an aggressive and appropriate manner. Um, in your uh, uh, testimony for the association, you say, quoting now, <clears throat> first we believe that it is very important to increase the independence of the special trustee. Um, would that include support of legislation in the Congress to uh, set a term certain for the special trustee grandfathering in the current trustee to that term? Am I clear? Do you? Yes, sir, you are clear. Yeah. And it is my belief sitting here today that, that our organization and most of the tribes would support that kind of legislation. Mm -hmm. That's not a particular question. I have put two any of them, so that's my speculation on the subject. But I would think it would do a couple of things. It would give, I don't, this guy may not be, we may not be able to stand him after he gets through listening to us say all these nice things about him. But uh, barring that, uh, we think we're, we would like to, we like the sense that the guy that's in the job now would be given, a really given an opportunity to get that job done. We also think the kind of term certain that you suggest, Mr. Williams, would also go somewhat toward increasing his sense of independence and make his, uh, and whether it's, whether it's Mr. Holman or anybody else in that position, perhaps a little less sensitive to the, the every other November concerns that seem to affect everybody in this town. And uh, he, he could go about his job of being an honest banker and worry less about uh, what the kind of press his boss is going to get in tonight or tomorrow's news. There is, uh, I want to note uh, for the record, as well as to bring to the attention of all the interested parties, there is uh, active consideration in the Congress <clears throat> to try, even at this late time, to uh, To, to enact laws that would uh, further stabilize and guarantee the independence of the special trustee. Our difficulty, of course, particularly on the House side given our rules, is to try to get anything of that nature uh, uh, included in uh, any of these uh, couple of year-end vehicles uh, that, uh, you know, might lend themselves to it. It may be that the uh, Senate, given their rules different than ours, uh, would be better able to include something uh, in one of the omnibus bills. But uh, I know from talking to members on both sides of the aisle, and uh, as all of the witnesses have recognized and every member of Congress recognizes, this task force under uh, the uh, good uh, uh, leadership of the chairman has adhered, adhered strictly to bipartisanship. And uh, I've found members on both sides of the aisle in both the House and Senate who are expressing enormous concern about um, the stability of the office of the special trustee under the uh, able uh, person of Mr. Holman. If we aren't able to get uh, legislation passed, I have the clear sense that a number of us on both sides of the aisle may want to make it very clear in communications to both the President and Mr. Babbitt, Secretary Babbitt, that uh, we have these concerns and uh, particularly why the, while the Congress is out of session, we would object strenuously to any changes in the status of the special trustee. Well, we appreciate you being here on, uh, on short notice, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, Mr. Henderson, we thank you uh, for your 
point of view, and we will uh, continue to take into account your advice and your very unique perspective on what we may do to, to work on this problem. Thank you very much, sir. I, on my way out, Mr. I, may I assume that the record will be open to receive a resolution and act adopted by the tribes comprising this Intertribal Monitoring Association with respect to Mr. Homan's role and the comments Mr. Williams just made? Indeed, commensurate with the rules and the lifespan of the task force, the record will remain open for two weeks. Uh, so that, that's the due date, Mr. Uh, okay. Mr. Harrison. Well, we have, we have it in town. I just don't have it in hand. But that's thank quite you, all right. Chairman. Okay. Thank we you, appreciate sir. you coming in this morning, sir, and thank you very much. And now it's uh, our privilege on this task force to uh, call to the witness table the chief of the Blackfeet Nation, Earl Oldperson. Certainly happy to defer to my colleague from Montana. Thank you. Um, Earl Oldperson and I are old friends. And uh, I'm always honored to be in a uh, committee when, when the chairman and chief of the Blackfeet tribe uh, comes to testify. Earl is no stranger to the Congress. Uh, and uh, the Congress... Um, has always enjoyed and benefited from our relationship with all Native Americans, and uh, I would add most particularly our old pal, Chairman Earl Oldperson. Earl, it's always good to see you, sir. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hayworth and Congressman Pat Williams. And Chief Oldperson, before you get into your comments, sir, sorry to interrupt, but if you'd also take the time to introduce the lady who accompanies you yes. with this table. Yes, I was. <coughs> With me is Eloise Cabell, who is a member of the Blackfeet tribe and was involved in this particular issue that uh, is being discussed right from its beginning. What I want to say today in the beginning is that I'm not an expert in anything, but I'm here representing the natives and in particular Blackfeet tribe. We have two laws that we go by. First, we have a, a spiritual law, and we have a person that we have to make it right with on those laws. Then we have the law, the natural law that we have within this world and within the government. I'm sure that my people in the past done their best to uphold these laws that we have. It was mentioned about treaties here. Our people, those treaties that were made by our ancestors, the agreements, our people held them sacred. They believed in them. And to those that they made agreements with and treaties with, they felt that they felt the same way and should treat them likewise. In the beginning, I want to say that although that it's been said at times that we come from somewhere else, but as far as our ancestors is concerned, and according to our ancestors, we were here. We can't help it. And we're going to be here so long as our leadership is with that strength and continues. We have done everything to the best. Even our people in the past have done everything to abide by the things that they were directed to abide by. We were asked, to, our people were asked to attend schools, education. Sometimes it was very severe for them. But yet they'd done their best to abide by those laws even at that time. And that didn't, they didn't dwell on those things that happened to them at that time. They were forbidden not to do certain things in their Indian way of life. 
while they were at school. But they didn't use that to hold back their children from receiving education because they felt that this was very important after they began to analyze the future. They foretold us many things. The lands that we have, although it's said that they're reservations, they're reserved for us, but I, I say there are lands that our people are able to keep for us. These lands are our homeland. And we try to maintain them, preserve them, develop them to the best that we can. Our populations are increasing rapidly. And it's making our reservations become smaller, not in size, but because of the population. It is difficult to accommodate everybody. But to those that are on the reservations today, the lands that we have, we try to use them so that we can help one another. This particular issue that we are talking about, had it not been for someone back in May of 91, or even before then, finding and seeing that there's something wrong. We won't be here today. This thing will go on and on. Our people are always careful in the things that they do. Sometimes we're referred to as people that really don't know too much. But in our Indian way of life, our ancestors, our people, even the people that I, elders that I started my career with as tribal leader, taught me many things. And they taught me that you must first go according to the laws that are before you. I got on the council in 1954, and I've been on since. Became chairman in 1964. So a lot of things had happened, and I saw a lot of changes and a lot of things. People come to me in many ways, many times. And our people, they know when there's something wrong. They'll bring it to our attention. I talked to another group the other day here. I said some of our young leaders, some of our leaders uh, in the past, not too long, they refer to our elders as we don't need them anymore. But after our elders passed away, they realized that they lost something. And they begin to say, I wish those elders were still here because they're the people, they are the background, and they're the people that gave us some directions. Federal government has given us help. There are federal funding that comes to the Indian reservations, and we are very careful in how we handle that kind of a money. The minute that we do not send in the kind of reports that the government wants, the minute that we, they find that there's something wrong within the federal funding that they send, right now we're notified of it. Right now they want us to correct it. And we do everything to correct whatever the problem may be. And I believe that is all that we are asking today that if there is that wrong that has been done, let us correct it. How can we correct it? How can we satisfy the minds of the people that is, is directly the victims of this particular wrongdoing or mismanagement? 
nothing else. I'm not about to answer any of these questions that are being asked because I think there's something need to be fixed first. Then I think we can begin to say, all right, let's handle it this way, let's do this. I have my leaders back home, myself, I'm speaking of just the black people. Other tribes have their leaders that they have to come together with to decide what, what do we see is the best way of handling these kinds of things that we see that's been wronged. This is the only thing that my people have, is these lands, whatever it's derived from. And it's our own. We're not asking the government. It's not a government money funding that we're asking to be correct. It's our own money that we're hoping that can be corrected. If I might say a little bit about our individual money accounts, a lot of our people back home that's the only thing that they depend on, is what money they get off of those lands. We have some people back home that are the victims. We have people back home that are on fixed income that they have some hardship. Many people don't know. We, we don't, we have no argument whatsoever against our government helping other foreign countries, foreign people, that's a need. But we also have people right here in the United States that are just as much in need. But we don't come out asking. And so today, this particular issue that we are talking about, we have some direct experiences. I've had people come to me that, that I'm basing my arguments, my concerns on. Our government has asked the tribe a few years ago to set up an accounting system which again, we abide, we, we want, we'd done everything to set up an accounting system for the tribe. And I asked one of the government employees, do you folks have a system? They says, no. But yet they were asking us to set up a system of that kind when they did not have it themselves. And so, as I've said, that we have done everything that we can to help within our own government, within the, the government that we deal with, the federal government, and any government that we work with. And we feel that, and we try to do the right thing. And this is the thing that I think brings down our people, especially our elders, when they hear about these things, they wonder what is going on. And with all the technical things that is taking place, the technical system that we have today, we shouldn't have anything wrong. We should be able to keep up with things. And so this morning, all I ask that there is a person or persons that are concerned, have their concern for us. I certainly appreciate you people for allowing us and allowing me to be here and to be able to express my thoughts and my how I see it and my understanding of this particular situation. But I agree that I hope that this person that is trying to remedy the thing that is wrong will be giving that chance to help us out. And through you, people, you are the power. We ask that you folks help us out. Not telling you that we want something new, but just correct and give us some direction so that we would not have this in the future. And I, I again, I want to say that 
I'm speaking on behalf of the Blackfeet people, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all Indian people who are involved in this particular case. It's true, we were hurt in Phoenix. I think somebody should have known ahead of time, until, unless they were totally ignorant of the purpose of the meeting. They should have told us that this may not go on. That's the reason I went down there. It's because we were going to talk about, discuss a settlement. But it was very disappointing to be told. And like you stated, it's a hardship on us. We don't have the money to travel all over. We have to sacrifice what little we have because it's important to us. These kinds of discussions are important to us. It's a future for our people, the upcoming generation. And so with that, I want to say, I want to thank you, and I want to ask you that do what you can, because we still exist, and we are still looking forward in using that what we have and still work with everyone that we are to work with and we can work with. Thank you. Chief, we'd like to thank you very much for your comments. You may have heard the bells uh, uh, sound. There is a vote on, and I guess we have about seven minutes to get over to the floor to vote. Let me, oh, we, and we have a series of five votes. Um, with that in mind, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. We will take into account what, what you have had to say to us, uh, recognizing the fact, Chief, that you correctly point out this is money belonging to the first Americans. This is not the government's money. We look forward to working with you and Ms. Cavell in the days ahead. We thank you for what you offer in this testimony here, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Let me uh, call on briefly a gentleman uh, who has appeared uh, before us uh, before from the Native American Rights Fund, Mr. Robert Paragoy. Uh, Mr. Paragoy, uh, given the fact that you are well skilled in summarizing arguments and mindful of the uh, responsibilities we have on the floor, could you briefly outline what you believe to be the course of action we should take legislatively? I most certainly will, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing uh, me to testify today. Uh, I appear uh, on behalf of uh, 300,000 individual Indians who comprise the uh, putative class in the uh, class action litigation, uh, Cabell uh, v. Babbitt, to uh, uh, compel uh, uh, equitable uh, redress for the government's gross mismanagement of uh, these trust funds over the course of the last 158 years. And uh, in uh, summary fashion, uh, there, in, in response to the questions that you have uh, posed uh, to us here, uh, we are uh, not in a position to answer a number of those because they are uh, intimately tied up and interwoven uh, with the litigation, uh, uh, which is uh, under now the jurisdiction of the court and the supervision of the court. And so uh, in my written testimony, which I have uh, submitted for the record, I have uh, uh, asked that, uh, uh, that uh, we ha must respectfully decline to answer a number of those questions um, uh, by way of reason of the litigation. Um, I think it's very important for this committee to know that the litigation is on a fast track. Uh, uh, the court has scheduled regular uh, status conferences. We're meeting cooperatively uh, with um, officials from the Department of Justice and the Department of the Interior, and uh, we hope that we can move to uh, an expeditious resolve of, of these issues. And as other uh, witnesses testified this morning, uh, Mr. Cohen, et cetera, uh, as the uh, litigation proceeds and uh, as the strategic plan becomes final, some of these questions that you put to us will become uh, a little bit clearer in terms of response. But the main thing that we have heard this morning, I think from everybody, that is our point is that what needs to be done is to fix the system now. And Congress needs to put up the money to do that. The special trustee has indicated it will cost about $147 million over a five-year period. Uh, this is a drop in the bucket with the, um, the amount of liability that we're looking at uh, uh, with the federal government's breaches over the course of the last 158 years. Um, 
And that's the price that it will take for the government to finally live up to its trust responsibility. And uh, it's very incumbent on all of us, uh, particularly the administration and Congress, to work in bipartisan fashion to put up those dollars so that those breaches of trust will cease and so that the government can finally start honoring its trust responsibility. Uh, I, I think that um, to look at other future-oriented questions uh, uh, is a bit premature while the system remains broke. And uh, I think that's the message, that we need to fix the system and Congress needs to put the money up to do it. And uh, basically, uh, that would summarize my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Perigoy, we thank you for, for the brief summation of your remarks. Your entire testimony will be included in the record. We're mindful of the fact that there is pending legal action. Indeed, we've been reminded of that a few times this morning with a variety of different inquiries. So with that, we thank you for addressing the problem. We will continue to stay in touch with you as the task force continues its duties uh, and its obligations to the first Americans. And we thank you for your time and attendance this morning and at, all, at the other uh, sessions that this uh, task force has held publicly. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we express our appreciation to you for your leadership. And I'd also like to state, uh, uh, for the record, to thank uh, Chairman Don Young for his uh, critical support this past week in urging House Appropriations Committee leaders to concur with the Senate appropriation mark of $36.3 million. That's the administration's request, and that's the kind of bipartisan cooperative work that we need to get this job done and fix the system. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And mindful of that fact, I would just let you know that uh, we are working very hard. Chairman Young, chairman of the full committee, uh, working uh, in a bipartisan fashion to accommodate that request and to move forward with that. And with that, I thank you very much for your time, sir. And uh, would like to thank those in attendance this morning, uh, the uh, staff members of, of both sides of the aisle for their help throughout the course of uh, these hearings. And with that, uh, the task force hearing stands adjourned. to investigate management of the trust fund was created last May. It's managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Saturday on About Books. We'll hear how the Library of Congress, diaries, letters, memoirs, court records, even advertisements help.